You're listening to Beyond the Classroom, going where history happens. Perfect. What have you done? You went to Dallas and you found a story. Well, I was at the JFK Lancer conference in yeah, Dallas. Yeah. And on the bill, one of the speakers uh, I really didn't recognize, it was Monica Mercedes Perez Jimenez. It's a pretty awesome name. There's a reason for it. We'll let her, <laughs> we'll let her tell you a little bit later, but... She is the daughter of Marita Lorenz. That's a name anybody connected with the Kennedy assassination knows, or clandestine America from back in the time of the 1960s. Because she, as a young woman, was recruited. She was commandeered by the Central Intelligence Agency in one of their several plots to kill Fidel Castro. You went to Dallas and you wandered into the deep shit. I did. Yeah, wow. I did. She was wow. there. Wow. And, uh, she had just spoken uh, to an audience, a very attentive audience, to a riveting story. And when she was finished, I went and met her in the hallway. It was arranged so I could go meet her, just the two of us. And uh, she agreed. And I noticed a couple of things about her while we were out negotiating what would become the recording session. She is very powerful. She's a very small, diminutive woman, but very powerful, very sure of herself. Yeah. And she was very emotional. I explained to her how I knew a little bit about her mom and that I had recordings with her mom and with Frank Sturgis, a.k.a. Frank Fiorini, We'll explain who all these people are soon. We'll try to, yes. yes. <laughs> but um, my antenna went up because I do have recordings of Frank Sturgis telephone calls during the late 70s after two investigations in Congress, the Church Committee, which, which exposed some of the abuses of the Central Intelligence Agency, and then the House Select Committee on Assassinations, in the late 1970s that investigated the Kennedy assassination. You're telling me we're about to do a podcast about the CIA. Well, they're involved. There's no question. They're, okay. There, there's no question. Here but, we go. But that they are involved, yeah. And I, I caution people when they talk about the CIA yeah. as a blanket organization exactly. or the teachers union right. or the police department. The vast majority of people in the police department are absolutely unequivocally good people, but there could be a rotten apple. And if that rotten apple is commandeered for sinister purposes, along with other people in other organizations for sinister purposes, yeah. then you have a bit of a conspiracy there. So I never, never answer in the affirmative. Do I think the CIA killed Kennedy? Uh, do I think the military-industrial complex killed Kennedy? Do I think the mob killed Kennedy? It's a generalization, and a generalization by its definition is, is going to be at least partially wrong. Even if it's mostly right, it's going to be partially wrong. So the answer is, well, no, the CIA is not a monolithic thing. It's just, it's just huge. I don't know how many people work for the CIA, but tens of thousands of people. So we're saying that I don't know that they're rogue elements. I mean, that's the thing about the CIA. We're talking about this is the era of which Dulles was it that was the head of the CIA? Alan Dulles. Alan Dulles was the head of the CIA. Who was fired by President Kennedy at a time when Kennedy made this statement. I will smash the Central Intelligence Agency into a thousand pieces. He wanted to get rid of it. And his concern went back to their plan, miserable failed plan to force the United States into a military conflict with Cuba to get rid of Fidel Castro and get Cuba back. We call it the Bay of Pigs invasion or the Bay of Pigs fiasco. Alan Dulles was a guy who 
pretty much figured that the CIA was a mechanism for the United States to do whatever the hell it wanted to advance its own interests. I mean, that sort of was his mindset. That's a statement that I'm making. I'm not putting that in your mouth, but I but, appreciate that. <laughs> but in my in my reading, because I tend to go all in on this stuff, but in my reading of this, I'm like, this guy seems like a sociopath. Or no, I'm, let me take that back. I can just cut it because I'm editing this. Um, Alan Dulles is a guy who was very assured of himself, and he had a vision for what the CIA would be, and he, he really saw it as a very proactive arm of advancing United States interests. Of wedging himself and his organization between communism and the American capitalist system. Right, right. That would be my take on it. Sure, yeah. And he and his organization are indispensable in that struggle between corporate American capitalism and communism. I mean, they're the cold warriors. I mean, it's like these are the, yeah, these are the guys who are fighting when bullets aren't flying, the CIA is, is the army, as Alan Dulles conceived it. And he was the head. He wasn't the only one. There are many others that were, were of similar... Yeah, but I mean, he was the head guy, and so it, it flowed from him. And so that's not what John Kennedy... That was not his vision of the CIA. And so when we're saying about smashing it to a million pieces, that's... That's a very powerful enemy. Yes. That John Kennedy has just created. Yeah. Irony of ironies, Alan Dulles becomes one of the Warren commissioners that investigate the assassination of President Kennedy. So it's not really fair to say that the CIA is anything. But it's not. No, no, it's really not. Yeah, but you do have Alan Dulles trying to protect the interests of the Central Intelligence Agency and keep it out of the Kennedy assassination to whatever degree. Yeah. Right. And there... And he has total plausible deniability in this. But what's that famous case of it's a soft power thing where the king says, who will rid me of this man? And like the knight goes off and kills the Archbishop of Canterbury. I've stood on the spot where the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury was butchered to death. And who was the king? Uh, Henry II. Okay. But, but the- I'm out on a limb a little bit, but I... My money's on Henry the Second. Okay, so Henry the Second's fed up with this guy, and he says, "Who will rid me of this man?" And he did not tell anyone to go off and kill him, but he made his wishes known that he's sick of this guy. So somebody, one of his underlings, just goes and does it, and that's the kind of power that we're talking about. That's sort of the example of this, this okay, hard soft. Okay, I get power. your point. Right. Gee, are we okay with the pops over here? We'll explain if anyone's curious about the pops. And the traffic noise, perfectly timed truck. We're recording in our new studio, which is not an ideal studio, but it's cozy for us. It's not a good recording spot, but it's fun. Um, so it's a nice got, little wood stove. We've got a little wood stove going, and we've got some pops, so you're going to hear some noises. I always like to preface any podcast. I'm like, this is a podcast, not a Steely Dan album. So if you have a problem with the audio... Go stick it. Um, we'll do our best. You're going to hear some extraneous noises, but we're here to tell you a story, and that's what we're going to do. Yeah, but we're okay with the noises, yeah. We're going to live with it. So back to Monica? Back to Monica, yeah. So so the point of the whole CIA digression is she's just all wrapped up in this. She is uh, because it's personal for her, as it would be. Her mother was involved on the periphery, certainly with some of the people who have been accused of being at least outliers, if not directly involved uh, in the Kennedy assassination. And I was talking about the phone calls that were recorded by Frank Sturgis, of Frank Sturgis, who was trying to protect himself and deflect from the House Select Committee on Assassinations in the late 70s, the finger pointing at him as a possible person to be identified as as having been involved in the assassination of President Kennedy. It looked like Frank Sturgis thought it looked like the finger was being pointed at him as one of the conspirators to kill President Kennedy. And so he began in a bit of paranoia to record his own phone calls. Okay, so let's go into who he is. Frank Sturgis. uh, 
Frank Sturgis is most famously known as one of the Watergate burglars. Oh, okay. Breaking into Democratic National Committee headquarters on behalf of the committee to re-elect the president. C-R-E-E-P. You can't make that up. Can't make it up. And eventually, uh, he and the other Watergate conspirators would be found guilty to various degrees. Most of them would cooperate in the investigation. So Sturgis also, in another life, uh, worked for Fidel Castro until he, like many others working for Castro, began to realize that Castro was converting the island of Cuba into a communist system. Where did Sturgis come from? Was he a uh, U.S. citizen? uh, Sturgis is Cuban. Oh, he's Cuban. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. (laughs) Frank Fiorini. That was his original? Yes. Sturgis is an alias. Oh, okay. Right. Anyway, people like that turned against Castro, and Castro didn't necessarily fire all of them, but let them go, replace them. And, and As uh, he's, I hate to do it to you, but we, I think we should do a little bit of a history of Cuba, like what that transition, because that's a big deal. Castro, his, people aren't going to necessarily know what. Well, the, the official Cuba. date of the uh, uh, revolution led by Fidel Castro uh, what was Cuba before this revolution? It was a dictatorship under Fulgencio Batista. And uh, he was a thug, but he was our thug. Yeah. He was America's thug because he kept the money flowing. And American business interests were enormously profitable by dealing in Cuba with sugar cane and Another uh, gambling casinos. casinos. Yeah. The mob was in Havana at the Hotel Nacional, for example, which I visited once with some more than some curiosity. Um, but capitalism was flourishing down there. But much to the disadvantage of the vast majority of Cuban people, they were receiving none of the benefits of an American capitalistic type system being used in Cuba. All the money was coming back to, like, Chicago. Well, uh, uh, lots of it, yes. Yeah, and yeah. people were being paid off and were living very high in Cuba. But most of the people were suffering miserably. And Working so, on plantations. I mean, this is the kind of, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So when Castro came to power, he promised to change all that. But Sturgis... As, as well as people like Pedro de Lanz are ones who left Cuba and okay. ended up, the majority of them, in the Miami area. So just, just to summarize, Cuba is a dictatorship. Americans are making a lot of money down there by exploiting the locals as... Labor force. As the labor force. Castro comes in and says, no more. And he, he nationalized everything. He just says, we're, it, which means we're communists now. And Castro pissed off everyone. The U.S. government—I mean, like all of those, co- all of those companies are now. Well, he nationalized all the industries down there. Yeah. To the benefit of the Cuban people. And so now the mafia is cut out, the pineapple growers are cut out, the shank, like all of these enormous companies. I don't. United Fruit. United Fruit, yeah. United Fruit was one of the great benefits. And they made huge amounts of money, and all of a sudden, boom, they're gone. They're not only gone, but their assets yeah. are gone. Yeah, these C- C- Castro says, oh, your casino, that's mine now. And if you're a mobster in Chicago, all of a sudden... You've lost one of your steadiest uh, forms of income. A lot of money. So that's a huge deal and pissed off a lot of people. And Frank Sturgis says, see, sees that coming, and he's like, okay, i I'm, I got to get out of here. And he does. And he ends up uh, in the United States. Do we need... F- for this podcast, do we need a summary of what the Bay of Pigs is? I think we do, right? It was an ill-fated, U.S.-backed invasion of Cuba on the south coast at the Bay of Pigs. It was organized by the CIA. It was. Elements of the CIA, people within the CIA, were tasked with putting together a little army to go and take Cuba back from Castro. The idea was that 
the pent-up frustration with Castro's institution of a communist system in Cuba would cause people en masse, once they saw and gained a little bit of confidence that this 2506 brigade was invading and had the arms, etc., yeah. to supply them that they could take on Castro's army, get rid of Castro. They thought he was ripe to be overthrown. They were wrong. They were wrong. Those poor fellows who were landed on the beach were sacrificial lambs. Yeah. They were cannon fodder. So they showed up. What, what what happened to them? What did they see? What They were obliterated. Castro knew they were coming. Uh, Castro's military forces were very well informed, very well strategized, and overwhelmed uh, the members of the uh, 2506 Brigade. And they just showed up in boats like it was Normandy? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but it wasn't Normandy. No. They, they called for air support, and that's where Kennedy becomes an enemy to the anti Castro Cubans. They felt, many of them still do to this day, those who are still left that I've talked to, that it was the failure of the United States to, to provide air support to get Castro's forces off their backs at the Bay of Pigs that caused the debacle at the Bay of Pigs. He, they wanted air support and Kennedy said no. Correct. Okay. The Why? He was furious. He was embarrassed. He was furious. Uh, he knew because he didn't have anything to do with the Bay of Pigs. Well, it, the Bay, the Bay. Yes, he did. He okay. approved it, but it it wasn't. It was an Eisenhower administration plan. The idea of invading at the Bay of Pigs, and one of the first decisions Kennedy had to make when he came to office was, "Do you want to go forward with this? This is a way for us to get rid of a communist ninety miles from the United States." And he signed on the dotted line. He's he regretted a new pre- it. New president, and everybody's saying, "Go, go, go, do this." He regretted it uh, for the rest of his life. But he learned from it. And when the Cuban Missile Crisis came around in October of '62, he was much wiser, and was able to, despite enormous pressure yeah. from the United States military. And you can't blame the military. That's what they're trained to do. Yeah. They're trained to provide a military solution to a problem for the United States, so they're always going to advocate for that. That's what they do. That's what they do. That's what they do. So they advocated for what they do. We can help you. We can eliminate this problem, this communist problem in Cuba. Just give us the go. But Kennedy, he wasn't so trusting as he was when he signed off on the Bay of Pigs invasion. Okay. So we, I think we've provided some context for who Frank Sturgis is now. <laughs> a little bit. A little Not bit. Not enough. He's a very complicated guy. Yeah. Uh, and as you pointed out to me in a telephone call, you never can believe Frank Sturgis. A friend of mine, Sherry Sullivan, whose father was lost in all of this, said to me in a recording, I recorded it, that... Some of the things that Frank Sturgis said to her, were at, she interviewed him, mm-hmm. were absolutely true. And they could be confirmed. And other things, they weren't true. So he would and could lie indiscriminately, but within the fabric of those lies, there was some truth, yeah. enough truth. So you say, son of a gun. This is going to be very complicated for me to sort out what's right and what isn't right. What can be confirmed, what can't be confirmed. Frank Sturgis is a person that would tell you one thing because he felt it was in his best interest. And he might tell me the opposite thing for the same reason. Right. With the failure at the Bay of Pigs, the United States was looking for other ways to get rid of Fidel Castro clandestinely through so that failed but they still want this guy gone correct yeah correct so how to do it yeah and fabian escalante the chief of security for castro has identified 634 different attempts sponsored by approved by cultivated by some forces affiliated with the united states of america of trying to kill Fidel Castro. 
Unbelievable. The CIA identifies approximately two dozen. And they are detailed now. You can find them online. CIA attempts to eliminate Castro. But one of those involved the mother of my interviewee. Her name is Marita Lorenz. She was a young kid in her late teens on a boat that had arrived from Europe. And Fidel Castro went down to greet the boat, to inspect the boat out of curiosity with his entourage. And somehow his eyes met Marita Lorenz's eyes. As Marita's daughter Monica says, my mother was 18, 19 years old. Castro was 32, 33 years yeah. old. But it was love at first sight. And so she became his mistress. Eventually, she would end up involved in a plot, one of those plots that we're talking about here, to kill Fidel Castro. Okay, so her assignment is to go to Cuba and kill Fidel Castro. Um, Marita all, Lorenz has the assignment of killing Fidel Castro. All in a day's work. How the hell does <laughs> one go about killing Fidel Castro? It's a very interesting story of, okay. of how Marita Lorenz met Fidel Castro and how they become entangled with one another. And then we know she was recruited and trained to kill Fidel Castro. And we asked Monica how that came about. And so they, the CIA sends her down to, to do this. I think nowadays, well, we'll tell the story first, but um, when we come back, I think this is what they call the, the classic honeypot. You familiar with that term? No. This is what it is. You, you send in a hot girl, and she seduces him, and, and they're aware of this woman has this relationship with Fidel, and they're gonna, they got to turn her. Correct. They knew she could walk in to his abode under the most extraordinary of circumstances, and so she went in there to kill Fidel Castro at one point. And better to have Monica tell the story. Yeah. Let's talk about the specifics of the mission. I think people yes. would be interested in that. She was his, she met my she was with my grandfather on, on the Berlin Ocean Liner, a German ocean liner, and they docked in Cuba and Castro came aboard and he left his guns. She made him leave his guns down at the bottom and and that started their romance. He came on board. He, they, you know, he he brought his people. He was toured the ship. My grandfather welcomed him, and then he and Marita made a love connection. His reason for visiting the ship? He had he just he had never seen a more grand ship come into Cuban soil, and he that was his reason for it. He wanted to see this beautiful ship from Germany, so he felt safe enough to go because it was a German ship. Let me get this right then. In in his eye, he catches your mother. That's correct. Love at first sight. Kind at eighteen, of thing. she's eighteen, and he's she's in his thirties. He's in his thirties. I think he's thirty three. Okay. Thirty two, something like that. So, yeah. And this is what happened. And then he he they she went back, and he hailed for her to come back. And because my mother spoke a few languages, he he wanted her to be his secretary or one of his secretaries, his translator. She went back to Cuba, and they started their affair. And then that led to her pregnancy. Her pregnancy led to her losing a baby in the, her last term, in her eighth month. And then in the process of losing that baby, she she had a had ordered a glass of milk that was poisoned or had sedative. She was knocked out. She woke up and she had no longer had a, the fetus in her body. Now, can a fetus be removed at that particular point in time? It can be. It can be if it's if it's uh, if it's induced properly. Was the baby aborted? I truly, don't think it was. I truly believe it. And she's truly. This is from my mother's point of view: is that the baby was removed, was removed, and and kept there, was alive, and they they refused to let the baby go because the baby would have been murdered as soon as it got to the United States. So that's the reasoning for keeping the child there. It was it was a child of Cuba. It's going to stay in Cuba. 
And a rough time stamp for this is this late 1959. 59. I was going to say late 50s, mm -hmm. very late 50s. Late 59. Everything happened in 59. Castro had only been in power for a short time. That's correct. First of January, That's 1959. Yeah. So then, so then Marita was sent back to the United States after the, the, the child was removed. They medically had to deal with her. And in the process of that, that's when she was enveloped she became cia chum and they just went for her and they they brainwashed her with with again the details of what they did to my mother was was horrifying to hear the the use of of pictures of slaughtered infants the use of picture the use dead ba crying babies constantly they recording of a crying baby for my mother. They, they had a crucifix above her bed and crucifixes around to remind her that she had to do God's work or God was going to punish her. So the manipulation of a poor, this, I think the manipulation is a horror story in itself. And, and to use a woman, it's very specific woman. It's a very specific woman's thing. I'm trying to point out here because the manipulation they've done to men is one thing, but to what they've done to a woman using a child is 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 heinous and and I've never heard in any in in the whole world I've never heard a story like my mother's that this is what they've done to a woman. And this was done in Cuba. This was done in the United States. This in New York United City. States. How did they get her away from Castro? Uh, whoever it was that they removed Castro was not there. They removed her. One of Castro's people removed her. She was bleeding. They had to send her back to the United States. She was bleeding, and she's an American citizen. They wanted her out. So your mom is being taken care of medically in New York. Yeah. Has the child. From Where do we go from there? So at this point, when she's back in New York now, the, the CIA is working her. By 19, she was, she was recruited by MK Ultra Means to become an assassin. This all happened before she was 20 years old. We're, we're going to pause right there because she drops this term MK Ultra. We should talk about what MK Ultra is because that's also freaking insane. Yeah. So MK Ultra was a program that was part of, and this is document. And this is not even controversial. This is like a real thing. <laughs> it's going to sound like it's crap, but this is a real thing. Um, and this was like the multiple branches of the military used this thing called MK Ultra, but this is where we're going to lose people because I'm going to I'm going to use a phrase mind control, and that's what MK Ultra is about, and it's about using various means to control to to get people to do what you want them to do, other governments and that sort of thing, and it started I think in the late fifties, and she specifies exactly the technique and yeah. strategy they used with her mother. Yeah. And she, they might they might not use the same strategy on another person because they're not uh, under the same circumstances. And I think if you're skeptical about even the concept of mind control, which I think anyone would be, just imagine buying a drink for someone in a bar. That's the example that I like. So if you are buying a drink for someone in a bar, that is your version of MK Ultra because you're giving them a chemical that will make them less inhibited and in most cases you want them to have sex with you or, or you know in a bar or whatever but you're loosening someone up in a social situation and MK Ultra is taking that concept to the nth degree so they're like developing all kinds of different techniques different chemicals all this kind of stuff to get people to do what they want them to do in service of advancing American interests, and that is what MK Ultra is. And when they want it done. And when they want it done. They want to be able to pull you out, push a button, and off you go. Yeah, so MK Ultra was real, and it worked. <laughs> and in this particular case, it was used on Monica's mother, Marita Lorenz, yeah. who was recruited. Suffice it to say, a gross violation of civil rights. It becomes difficult because uh, some people might, could, I don't know who, yeah, not you, yeah, not I, could volunteer, okay, for the program, okay, whereas others are just picked, picked out, uh, innocently. This uh, person was not. It was not a volunteer. No, no, goodness, no. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
brutality of just using a child to do to do the work of of the world is is heinous to me to say the least at this I still look at it as like, how could you have done that to my poor mother? The MK Ultra was used on her. Christ. She she was as to make her an assassin, and when they got back, her you know she was already vulnerable because she had lost a child, and her her physicality was already at question. She was bleeding. She was hemorrhaging. She's already in a bad place. They took that vulnerable child. They hung a cross over her bed and told her that God was going to strike her down if she didn't take. Fidel out and she needed to do God's work and they they used God on her they used drugs on her they gave her drugs for during the day and drugs in the evening to function so this unfortunately was a problem she had to deal with for the rest of her life was because they they hooked her on specific drugs speed and then they managed to get her to a point where they sent her back to Cuba to assassinate him and when she's there she's flying on on all kinds of drugs and what did she say about that what was the plan what? She was to go there. She had botulism toxin. She put them in a Hans cold cream thing because she got nervous at the airport because they were checking bags. So she wanted to put them in there and she didn't want to use them anyway, but she wrapped them up as a tissue, put them in the ponds. When she opened up the ponds, they were destroyed anyway. So then she, her option was to shoot him. She didn't shoot him. So she physically pulled a weapon. Yeah, she pulled the weapon and, and she couldn't do it. And in, he in said Castro, he told her to shoot her. In Castro's presence. In the bedroom. And she, he and told he, her to shoot her. He said, shoot me. Go ahead, try it. And Castro said to your mother, yeah. shoot me. He goes, you can't kill me. Nobody can kill me. And she couldn't. She, had, she put the gun down, and then they made love. Boom, and done. they made love. Yep. <gasps> wow. Yep. Oh. And that was the last time she was with him. So she went downstairs. She was crying. The CIA all thought she was crying because they thought she murdered him, and he's upstairs dead. Meanwhile, they hear him on the radio, and she's with her guys. She actually told me one of them turned around and whapped her in the in the head when they heard Fidel's voice because she failed the mission. One of them smacked her, like just immediately smacked her. This is Marita's story. This is this is legacy I've grown up with. There's so much happening in that clip. There's so much to unpack. I don't even know where to start. So that's MK Ultra, and in this case, MK Ultra. She says they use God on her. Like they'll use anything. We're talking about buying somebody a drink. They use God on her. What What was that about? Well, I wanted to find out the answer to that also, yeah, uh, okay, Reggie. Good. And uh, the, uh, so I asked her, I immediately thought to, given her background, Roman Catholicism, at least for Monica, without thinking, you know, her mother was at Bergen-Belsen, her mother was in Germany, and so there's a good possibility that the mother's not Roman Catholic. So I wanted to know, what role, if any, did Roman Catholicism play in in Marita Lorenz being recruited? Yeah. You and she both Roman Catholic? No, Marita was not Roman Catholic. I was raised Catholic because I was I was always attended Catholic school. So she wanted me to have a very good education. That was one thing she and my grandmother wanted me to have a very good education. And where did your elementary and maybe middle school, high school education take place? I, I attended uh, St. Joseph's of Yorkville in New York City on the Upper East Side. And that was in, in New York. It's one to eighth grade. So I went there. And then uh, after that, I attended Loyola High School in New York City, which I talked about because that is a high school I was sent to because of Alex Rourke, who was a major player here. Alex Rourke is an anti-communist with a lot of money, with airplanes, with his own airport, Opalaka, with B-26 World War II airplanes. Damn. And Bombers. Precisely. And bombing missions were flying into Cuba to get rid of Castro after the Bay of Pigs. He is what you and I talked about before, and that is uh, a proprietary, a person who doesn't exist doing things that aren't happening. Plausible deniability right. on the part of the Central Intelligence Agency. So if anybody gets caught in any of these things, the CIA will deny. We have no idea who this is. You can check. There's no link between the Central Intelligence Agency and this person that you've just arrested. 
Right. If you've ever seen a Mission Impossible movie, you know this concept. If you fail, we disavow any knowledge of your existence. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And Alex Rourke was one of those people. But we should defer to a woman okay. named Sherry Sullivan from Maine who, as a young girl living in Connecticut, lost her father, Jeffrey Sullivan, who was a 29-year-old pilot, also a proprietary. And he worked for Alex Rourke. Right. Rourke operated out of Florida. He was a virulent anti-communist. His father had been and had passed on that philosophy to his son. And he was a de facto proprietary contractor as a private person oh doing things out yeah. of the umbrella of the Central Intelligence Agency but to the benefit of the Central Intelligence Agency. And so from his airport in South Florida, pilots flew over Cuba. Sometimes they dropped leaflets. Sometimes they dropped chemicals to defoliate crops and ruin the economy. Sometimes they dropped bombs. And one of those pilots was Jeffrey Sullivan. Sherry Sullivan came to Brattleboro Union High School and spoke with two groups of my students. And a few years later, she did it again, this time via Skype. And the idea was for the students to realize that not always what you see is what you get. And there are human elements to these things as well. She was a young girl, nine years old, when she lost her father. He went away to work on a typical day, said goodbye to his family after eating breakfast and never came home. And she details what happened to him and also the process she went through to try to find her father. Yeah. She even contacted Fidel Castro. Strangely, he handed his St. Christopher medal and, and his navi navigational watch to her, leaving all identification behind. And that's his wife. He handed her the St. Christopher medal. So that was suspicious a little bit. He flew to Florida, meeting up with Alexander Irwin Rourke Jr. Together they made contact with Frank Sturgis and William Johnson to discuss a scheduled flight all four anti-Castroites were to take the next day. Johnson arranged for them to rent an airplane from his contact at Beach Aircraft Service to Fort Lauderdale. Johnson's another contract pilot. He's a Jeffrey Sullivan. Okay. Sturgis isn't. Sturgeon isn't a pilot. Johnson's another guy who doesn't exist. Right. Doing Flying airplanes that don't exist on operations that are not happening. Okay. He also disappeared. The type of plane capable of holding five 100-pound bombs they ought to be so often carried. Well, the FAA records that I um, ended up finally getting verified that the following day this plane did indeed leave for a five-day period. That morning, on the way to Opelaka Airport, a common base of operations in this war, Alex Work stopped to pick up Enrique Molina Garcia, a, new, a newcomer to their group. At 8 o'clock in the morning, the three of them departed, oddly, leaving Ger Sturgis and Johnson both behind. Throughout that day, tower communications with the plane became confusing. Flight plans and refuel stops changing from Panama to Guatemala. And so when she's getting information from a Freedom of Information Act, this is the kind of information that she's able to get. Yes, the Federal Aviation Administration is FAA. Because we sort of talk about the things that are not happening, but, they're, but there are footprints all over the place. Like, you can't circumvent every single thing. And you'll, she makes that clear, too. Flight plans and refuel stops changing from Panama to Guatemala to Nicaragua to Honduras. There were several aborted takeoffs. On at least two occasions, the aircraft returned to Fort Lauderdale for various reasons, at one time neglecting to engage proper landing gear. The tower had trouble understanding my father due to radio interference and, quote, poor pilot technique. That's how they explained it off. They, they crashed, it sounds like. I mean, that's weird. It's... Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? They but, landed without a landing gear. But in the official documents... It was the pilot's fault, and they couldn't understand the pilot. Weird. He's, he's American. Right. From Connecticut. Weird. <laughs> it's just everything's about this is weird. 
Finally, the men departed, losing communication with flight towers altogether. Back home in Connecticut, we waited. Silently, constantly, we waited. Nothing. As the weeks turned into months, the months into years, there just wasn't much talk about Dad, um, simply because no one knew what to say. It wasn't until our family Christmas dinner in 1984 that I became overwhelmed, looking around the table at three generations of women celebrating the holiday together. Sadly, I realized that Dad wasn't even acknowledged anymore with words or even thoughts. His memory had been buried so deep in our hearts that we, we hadn't dared acknowledge it. At the age of 29, the exact age Dad was when I last saw him, <clears throat> I came to a conclusion I would find my father. So in January of 1985, I wrote three letters, one to the CIA, one to the FBI, requesting information under the Freedom of Information Act regarding the activities and subsequent disappearance of my father. Oh my God, so her father disappears. Her father went to work, said goodbye to the family, did something unusual, yeah. handed over his St. Christopher medal to his wife, and took off for work. I think they're in Waterbury. He goes to Hartford and takes a commercial flight to Florida, then ends up at Opelika, meets up with Alexander Rourke. And again, there was a woman living in Hinsdale at the time of this. This is 2001. Yeah. Gee. Let me just say quickly, from her perspective, her father goes to work and doesn't come home, and they don't even talk about it because they don't know what to say. They don't know where he is. And all know. of a sudden, she's 29 and is like, and it's just hitting her in the face, like this whole time that he just disappeared, they didn't talk about it. Right. They have no idea what happened to this right. to her father. Except he went to work and didn't come home from work. He never existed. Proprietary. Oh my God. And the CIA doesn't call you up and thank you for your service. No. Or even give a plausible explanation because if they do that, they are allowing people to see that they are connected to this guy. Yeah. And plausible deniability is all to deny that. Okay. Yeah. Keep going. The, I wrote one other letter uh, to, to Fidel Castro with a s sincere human, humanitarian plea to help our family find Dad as it, was, as it was long believed he ended up in a Cuban prison. Okay, the Freedom of Information Act. As we hammered away at the FBI, it took, oh, almost a year before we got 12, 800 of the 1,200 pages that they um, possessed. Of the 800, approximately one-third was blacked out. So Freedom of Information Act is, uh, it comes up as FOIA. FOIA, F-O-I-A. It's a way for people, American citizens, to track down records to determine whatever they're looking for, the fate of somebody or what happened in a certain place under a certain set of the government circumstances. Keeps, the government keeps all kinds of records about everything. They, everything well, gets written down. And the point is, is that we as Americans... Can ha access that. We have a right to access that stuff, yeah. and we can use the Freedom of Information Act as uh, the mechanism that we can use to do that. The only thing I would change out of that statement you just made is you said, as many people do, yep. blanketly, the government. Sure. The CIA has its own documents. The FBI has its own. Defense Intelligence has its own. Secret Service has its own. So when you file... Even with the release of Kennedy assassination associated documents, when you file for those, you have to file for CIA documents. And they have X number of thousands of documents. But the FBI has this many also. And the Secret Service has this many. So it's many different organizations. You yeah. need to target the right organ organization. Sometimes, sometimes, not always, they cross thatch the FBI shares a document with the CIA and vice versa. In those days, not very often because they were very territorial. But since 9-11, we're told that that has they created the been rectified. They created the Department of Homeland Security to rectify all that crap. But yeah, you have to, this is not a Google search. Like, you have to know what you're looking for. And you've got to ask for very specific things. Same is true when you go to the National Archives to access information. Right. And there's all kinds of loopholes and exceptions to FOIA. Um, well, 
she she will yeah. talk about okay. that. Of the 800, approximately one third was blacked out. We began an appeal process, receiving one page of documentation, then another few, on and on for two years until they finally answered our last appeal, refusing to release any more documentation. Surprisingly, we learned that the FBI files had been sent to the House Assassination Committee in 1977 and soon realized why. She's talking about the House Select Committee on Assassinations, or the HSCA which was formed in the late 70s. That's the one in a previous podcast we talked about Bob Groden being called as an expert witness on the photographic and film evidence in the Kennedy case. And this was something that happened because the government was like, what is happening? Like, JFK is killed, Robert Kennedy is killed, Martin Luther King is killed, national and world leaders are being killed. And so these are the people that are looking into that. Is that That's absolutely right. And the criticism of the Warren Commission is now a groundswell many researchers are publishing books that are very contradictory to or, or pointing out flaws to the Warren Commission report. She just mentioned a fellow named Gaetan Fonzi. How do you spell that? F-A? G-A-E-T-O-N, Gaetan Fonzi, F-O-N-Z-I, Gaetan Fonzi. I knew Gaetan Fonzi. Wow. Yeah. I met him, again, through conferences in Dallas and even recorded him speaking on a, an occasion at the monument that the city of Dallas erected for President Kennedy. Very controversial monument. Okay. But suffice it to say, when talking about eyewitnesses to the Kennedy assassination, I talked about the professionalism of Dr. Ronald Jones, how he was the consummate professional. Gaetan Fonzi was that as an investigative reporter and then an investigator and contributor contributor to the House Select Committee on Assassinations. A titan yeah. of stability and professionalism. Gaetan Fonzi. He wasn't cracking a beer at 10 a.m. after the panel. 9.30. 9.30. Nine thirty. <laughs> no, he wasn't. Okay. I've got photographs on it. You know. <laughs> I saw it, yeah. yeah. So go ahead. I, I, I just want, that's who Gaetan Fonzi is. To quote um, committee investigator Gaetan Fonzi, Oswald's connection with anti-Castro Cubans was one of the key mysteries in the Kennedy assassination. Well, this was a frightening revelation to me. We also requested information from other government agencies with whom the FBI acknowledges having documents, including customs, DIA, INS, Department. There's your list when you require documents via FOIA. Listen to all those. The interesting one here is customs because yeah. her father flew out of the country. Those people keep documents. Sure. DIA, INS, Department of State, Air Force, Navy, Army, and the CIA. Well, the CIA immediately denied having documents altogether rega regarding my dad, yet throughout FBI files, indications were that certain FBI pages had been copied and sent to the CIA. So the CIA says they don't have anything, but she finds out through a back channel, a back door, I should say, not a back channel, yeah. that the FBI has shared some documents on her father's case with the CIA. So the CIA does have some documents. So she was able to get them that way. So Sherry Sullivan's 29 years old, and she's her father disappeared, and she's just like, I, I, I've got to figure this out. And so she's going for it. She's filing FOIA requests, and she's like flying to D.C. She's, she's on this. Okay. Exactly. On her own dime, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So. Keep going. Yeah. It was not until former Senator Cohen and his staff advocated the case for two years, excuse me, that I had made two trips to Washington, D.C., and that the, that the CIA finally admitted to and released some of their files. In all my naivety, I believe that the requested information on my father would make its way to my doorstep without undue process, unfolding itself gracefully with reverent respect. Well, I was very soon to realize that the Freedom of Information Act is neither free nor does it provide information simply upon request. And I never did receive a reply from Castro, by the way. And I've written several since then. We should also point out that Castro's still alive when she's talking. Um, you're right. And, and she's doing all this investigating. I think she said she started in 1984. Right. Okay. And she was 
what, 29 years old then? Yeah. So if you go back 20, 20 years, she she was nine years old when her dad. Right. So near after nearly three years of denied information from the government, of partially blacked out documents, of neither confirmed nor denied responses from the CIA, after hundreds of correspondence and phone calls, we took the case to court. For although several thousand pages of documentation had been collected from the 13 government agencies, the activities of my father remain difficult to define and that there surfaced numerous theories, speculations, assertions, and accountabilities regarding his fate. My friend and attorney, Carl McHugh, and I embarked on a journey that would inevitably engulf our lives. He gave me a key to his law office. I would go there with my nine-year-old daughter, Heather, in the darkness of early morning or early evening when the law office was closed. She would, at times, bring her pillow and blanket to sleep on the office floor while I sat at the computer, learning how to conduct a lawsuit against my own government. Uh, uh, that's got to be a trigger for her, too. Yeah. Her daughter's the same age she was. Yeah, yeah. Now, she's moving on here. She started at 29. She's into her 30s. On September 24, 1987, exactly 24 years after Dad disappeared, Attorney Carl McHugh filed suit on my behalf against nine government agencies. <coughs> Similarly, in 1988, we filed suit on behalf of Robert Thompson's family. Robert Thompson disappeared in a similar fashion in 1961. We utilized every avenue at our disposal, which included um, the Vaughn Index, an in-camera inspection, and went so far as to have the entire CIA file read by Senator Cohen. Yet we had no conclusive answer to our question, what happened to Jeffrey Sullivan and his partner, Alexander Rourke, just two months prior to pre President Kennedy's assassination, and what was their last mission, and who sponsored it? Yeah, the, um, the problem that I've had with part of this investigation is um, family cooperation from the Rourke family. Now, the Rourke the Rourke's and my family were, were getting quite close you know, before they disappeared, so I found it very interesting that the rest of the uh, family on their side didn't want anything to do with it. Matter of fact, when Unsolved Mysteries did their show, um, Mrs. Rourke threatened to sue them. That's it. Unsolved Mysteries. Okay. That's the ABC program. Oh, wow. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, and something's funny here because they were getting pretty friendly with Rourke the families, Sullivan and Rourke families. But now, when both of them disappeared, all of a sudden, the Rourkes were silent about it. I mean, he was... He's the boss. He's He was a big wig in this uh, proprietary. The family knew that that's their father's boss. Was that... I, I Yes. Okay. I'm going to say yes. Okay. So um, I, the woman that called, I guess she lives in Brattleboro. She's a, she's a relative of the Rourke's. And although she couldn't be here today, we made contact, which was a great. That was an awesome thing because she's, she's going to try to put me in contact with some members of the family that may be willing to speak with me. One of the things that Alexander Rourke was doing before he disappeared was to, um, well, he, I guess he called himself a newspaper man, which is a real common, that's very common front that some of these men used when they went to foreign countries. That was a way that they could get into the countries legally. Um, and so he had documentation. Uh, I guess he had made a film. I guess he had a manuscript. So he probably had a lot of pertinent information on who was sponsoring their, their flights and their bombing raids and all that. That's my next step when I get back to you know, get in contact with her and try to pursue that avenue. Well, that's the way it works, and it's, as we were saying earlier, I mean, most of the researchers that I know um, have jobs and they have families. It's, it's not something that they have, um, can put their full life sa you know, savings or time into, so we all share information, and this is, that's exactly how it happens. How daunting is that? Yeah. Yeah. Like her father disappeared. She spent her whole life working on this case. Trying to find out, and she ends up into the Netherlands of the underworld, and it connects to. Uh, is that the end of it? No, I just paused it because I'm sort of like, okay. I'm 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 just struck. I think maybe because I'm. Well, I'm a lot older than now than she was then. I mean, she mentions her her naivete, right? Like she thought this is something she might be able to pull off, right? 
I'd just get a, under the Freedom of Information Act. They'll yeah. give me the information. They'll send it in an envelope or in boxes. It'll yeah. show up at my house, and I can go through the records and find out what happened to my dad. Yeah, and and I and and we're just like, <laughs> well, we know, we know what we know. Um, I mean, she just never had a shot. Right, we know that now. Yeah, we know that now. Yeah. To enhance the FOI, the FOIA suit, which is what it's called, Freedom of, Informa Freedom of Information Act suit, an independent investigation became necessary in order to prove events, facts, and to produce people who could and would verify that my father was involved in covert operations. We were under constant deadlines to prove in court our assertions that the government did know what happened to my father. We began with only the few details of Dad's activities that were revealed through government documents, by newspaper articles, and by various memories from my mother. The investigation became extensive, producing several hundred contacts around the country. The hundreds of phone calls soon required follow-ups with personal interviews. Full of enthusiasm, apprehension, fear, but mostly hope, I traveled from my main home many times in order to get to know and find my father. These contacts did not come easily. I traveled up and down the East Coast, sometimes, sometimes hitching rides, borrowing money to pay for the trips. From prisons to bar rooms, I met them, CIA operatives, mafia men, assassins, Cuban exiles, and the newspaper reporters who covered Dad's activities back in the 60s. That ties those together for you. Intelligence, services, the mob, organized crime. The research that she's doing is incredible. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And without intention, found myself standing in the murky arena of an assassinated president. I met researchers, congressmen, authors. I met some of Rourke's family, and much to my surprise, found more families who had suffered the same circumstances. The revelation that our family wasn't the only family to exist in a world of frightening questions was both relieving but revolting. I'll now introduce you to the world that took my father from us. Okay, at Alexander Rourke, my father was really his personal pilot. So I think if it wasn't for my dad's association with Alexander Rourke, he would have been another Hoffenfuss that wouldn't have been heard about or known unless some big event happened. I mean... During the Iran-Contra, 1986, I believe, one of these cargo kickers going back and forth, not exactly the same, but like Jeffrey Sullivan's flight mm -hmm. flights, um, was shot down, and the pilot parachuted and was captured. And instead of doing what he was supposed to do, the pilot, Eugene Hassenfuss, uh, Hassenfuss means rabbit's foot. Okay. <laughs> oh, in German? Yeah. Yeah. Talked and made it clear that the United States was clandestinely supporting the Contras in the Iran-Contra affair in their war against the Sandinistas. He just, my, my dad was just a regular guy from a little town like this in Connecticut. Alexander Rourke, see his family was much more inf influential and I'll, I'll read you some about that here. Alexander Rourke's father was the assistant district attorney in New York who in 1919 prosecuted and convicted the founders of the Communist Party in the United States. So he was the very first one to convict the Communist Party in this, in this country. That's the year of the Palmer Raids. Yeah. Each and every adherent to this movement is a potential enemy or thief. By their misshapen features, sloping brows may be recognized the unmistakable criminal type. Those are the words of the then Attorney General of the United States, A. Mitchell Palmer, who orchestrated the Palmer Raids, trying to SOS, ship or shoot, suspected communists out of the country. There's a word for that, I can't remember. So Rourke Jr. followed in his father's footsteps regarding the issue of communism. He had gone, Rourke was uh, in charge of eight German province, provinces in uh, post-war Germany in the roundup of the Germans. So he had had a, an extensive intelligence army background. But um, I'm not sure yeah, exactly. I have not been able to gain access to Alexander Rourke's personnel records files from the, from the army. I don't know why, I've tried every way. And he's deceased, I should be able to. Putting Alexander Rourke's laundry out to the general public would be a disaster mm -hmm. to the Central Intelligence Agency. Physiognomy <clears throat> is the word. Is it? It's a real thing. <laughs> okay. Physiognomy, it's, it's Greek. 
meaning nature and um, genome. So face reading is the practice of assessing a person's character or personality from their outer appearance, especially the face. A. Mitchell Palmer, the Attorney General. So when, once uh, Alex work was out of the service, he became connected um, with the anti-Castro activities and, and engaging in flights over Cuba and leaflet distribution campaigns and purchasing bomber, bombers for the use in attack in Cuba. Alex became a key figure in our lives for during the late 50s to early 60s, my father became his pilot, his co-operator, his confidant. 1963 was an especially busy year for my father and Alex. They owned several boats and planes, some registered through Alex's Florida corporation, Hollywood Air, which supposedly owned or had at its disposal at least six jet fighters and two, 50, two, B, two B-52s. B-52s, she meant 25, but whatever. Hollywood Air, that's the proprietary used by the Central Intelligence Agency. So if everything goes belly up in whatever they're doing, it's Hollywood Air. It's not the Central Intelligence Agency. And somehow Rourke and his people are either financing themselves, not totally likely, maybe partially, but they're being paid by the Central Intelligence Agency in a, in a clandestine way. So it, it can't be traced. Two B-25s. I get those confused. They reportedly participated in at least 11 ex excursions to Cuba in 1963, which included bombing raids. Rourke reportedly had ties to the Kennedys, the FBI, the CIA, and the mob, and for some reason became extremely vocal, embarking on speaking engagements, writing articles, and even produced a, a documentary all detailing his excursions to Cuba, revealing that many were being financed by the CIA, including the flight in December of 61 in which pilots Robert Swanner and Robert Thompson disappeared. And I have newspaper articles from the 60s where both Alexander Rourke and Frank Sturgis, the Watergate break-in yeah. burglar guy, okay. Well, he's he was, um, he was uh, giving interviews to the newspaper people, and so was Alex, and they were, they were both admitting that the C they, these flights were CIA-backed. The government policies regarding Cuba were becoming more and more ambiguous at this time, however. This created difficulties for Rourke, which seemingly threatened his identity as a patriot. So does Castro and the Cubans have a reason to take out President Kennedy? Absolutely. Do the anti-Castro Cubans living in the United States who were foiled by the lack of air support, as they see it, for the 2506 Brigade at the Bay of Pigs invasion in April of 1961, do they have an incentive to take out Kennedy? Absolutely. Enter the world of Marita Lorenz to kill Castro. The brutality of just using a child to do to do the work of, of the world is is heinous to me, to say the least. At this I still look at it as like, how could you have done that to my poor mother? She was as to make her an assassin and when they got back, her you know, she was already vulnerable because she had lost a child and her, her physicality was already at question. She was bleeding, she was hemorrhaging, she's already in a bad place. They took that vulnerable child used to have they hung a cross over her her bed and told her that god was going to strike her down if she didn't take fidel out and she needed to do god's work and they they used god on her they gave her drugs for during the day and drugs in the evening to function so this unfortunately was a problem she had to deal with for the rest of her life was because they they hooked her on specific drugs you, you know? and she both roman catholic no marita was not roman catholic i was raised Catholic because I was I was always attended Catholic school so she wanted me to have a very good education that was one thing she and my grandmother wanted me to have a very good education I I attended uh, St Joseph's of Yorkville in New York City on the Upper East Side in New York it's one to eighth grade so I went there after that I attended Loyola High School in New York City which I talked about because that is a high school I was sent to because of Alex Rourke who was a major player here, and they groom CIA agents. Can you unpack that a little bit? Because she doesn't... She seems to be saying to me that this school system, Loyola High School, was fertile ground for the Central Intelligence Agency, 
they okay. began the grooming of potential agents down the road out of this high school. Okay. This Jesuit high school. And we know that's a thing, like like Ivy League schools and MIT, and like they'll pluck people out of those institutions. So we know that's a thing that they do. As you would. I mean, it makes sense. They're recruiting. That's where there's talent spotting. So she's talking about Alexander, Alex, Alex Rourke, come up a couple of times. We need to unpack him a little bit, too, because he's a part of the story. This insane-ass story with all these characters, and he's one of them. So who's this guy? Alexander Rourke is a virulent anti-communist with money. So he has that organization that seemingly here is being used as a proprietary to do the dirty work of the Central Intelligence Agency, i.e. destabilize Fidel Castro, destabilize communism on the island of Cuba, and provide an opportunity for the United States to once again have control of Cuba with its capitalist, the, the American capitalist system imposed on Cuba again. So he's he's poking them. He's poking them, yes. And he is, again, a plausible deniability guy that the CIA can disavow any knowledge of. He's a guy who doesn't exist doing things that aren't happening. Never happened. <laughs> Holy crap. Okay, and so he's he has some involvement with her high school in New York City. Yes, and his pilot is Jeffrey Sullivan, who we just heard about. Sherry Sullivan's father, who disappeared. Holy mother. Okay. Let's come back with, uh, there was a constant battle between Monica's mother and yep. grandmother over Monica's future. So her mother and her grandmother are at loggerheads about what is going to happen with Monica. This, What was their conversation? Well, the grandmother wanted to keep Monica out of this world, and Marita wanted to pull Monica into the clandestine operations that were going on. Unbelievable. The grandmother says out, the mother says in. Of course, the mother's in as a result of her having been recruited by the CIA to kill Fidel Castro, the man she's having an affair with. And you got to wonder how much of that is like residual MK Ultra stuff. It's we a spe can speculation. Only speculate, speculation, yeah. but yeah. But here's what, what Monica said about it. Okay. Because my grandmother wanted to keep me out of this of this world and my mom wanted to pull me in. And so it was a constant battle in between my two parental figures, which were two women in my in my world, because I never had my father or or a father figure in my life. I wanted to go to the School of Performing Arts more than anything in New York City. And my mom refused. So it was a battle and and my mother won, and I got sent to Loyola. So Loyola, Ignatius Loyola. Say, yes, St. Ignatius Roman Loyola. Roman Catholic. Yes, Jesuit Catholic. Jesuit. Jesuit, yeah. yeah. Which is heavy. Heavy, dude. Heavy. Those guys opus day. Okay, that's crazy stuff. That's the, the Jesuits are like the army of the Catholics. The Jesuit uh, order of Roman Catholicism was founded by Ignatius Loyola at a time when countless People were defecting the Roman Catholic Church and going to Protestant churches. Loyola said, that's not the way to reform the Catholic Church. That's not going to do any good. We need to, rather than leave and quit on the Roman Catholic Church, we need to stay here and reform from within. And the way to do that is to tighten our belt so that they became the strictest, most determined, focused group of Catholic clergy in the world, and there are many Jesuit colleges in the United States today, Georgetown University, right. Notre, Notre Dame, Dame yeah. Boston College, Holy Cross, the College of the Holy Cross this is in when, Worcester. When, when did the Jesuits start? This is, this is a while ago. This is 16th century. Yeah. Yeah. Middle of the 1500s, uh, Protestant Reformation. Yeah. Martin Luther posted his 95 theses on the door of the church in Wittenberg, Germany in 1521. Did she throw a Latin phrase in there? Opus Dei. Yeah, what's that? That's something for you to look up. <laughs> I don't have it in... The, the, oh, the, Opus Dei, yeah. Oh, wait. Student. Theological conservative Opus Dei accepts the teaching of authority of the church without question. 
and has long been the subject of controversy. It has been accused of secrecy. Opus Dei is, oh, it's like a cult-like thing. Ultimate conservatism within the Roman Catholic Church. Theologically conservative, Opus Dei accepts teachings, the teaching authority of the, of the church without question. What the church says goes. Boom. Jesuit. That's it. Set to? Yep. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Yep. You can continue to play here. Holy fuck. Prior to my my incident with Frank Sturgis at 15. She's talking about Frank Sturgis, and when she's 15, um, she attempted to assassinate Frank Sturgis. This is her, not her mother. This is her. What the fuck? This is Frank Sturgis, not Fidel Castro. Right. All right she got into it with Frank Sturgis. All right. So about 15 crazy things just happened in the span of a sentence and a half. I'm going to give her a call. Okay. I'm going to ask her, can you describe specifically what happened when you tried to shoot Frank Sturgis, if she answers the phone? Yep. Hello? Good to hear, good to hear your voice. I'm sorry. I, just, I, I went to push the answer button, and it went, it went the other way. So <laughs> that's what I'm calling. Back. Sorry about that. No, 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 that's fine. I, 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 well, uh, uh, but, there, there were a few things from the uh, re- recording you and I made that mm-hmm. we'd like to pursue a little more, if you can help us with that, and I'll tell Absolutely. you. Absolutely. You mentioned uh, Octo- October 31, 1977, as a mm-hmm. date that uh, you had an incident. Could, could you elaborate on that, I think involving Frank Sturgis? That's correct. Um, On October 31st, 1977, uh, I was 15 years old, and I was arrested um, for possession of a firearm because that morning, instead of going to school, went outside my apartment building and waited for Frank to come into the building. And my job at the time was to protect my mom because I knew that from prior conversations that he had left on my mother's answering machine that I listened to, and because of my mother giving me a manifesto lecture the day before that if something happens, what I should do, I knew that he was coming to kill her because he had already done damage to my grandmother who was dying in the other room. So on that morning, I put my Loyola uniform on and I waited for him with my 25 automatic. I suppose that while I was waiting between the two cars, because I had kind of parked myself between two cars and waited. I saw a man that was coming down the street that I thought was Frank, and I shot at at that person, and I missed that person. I did shoot across a big avenue with buses and everything else. I was 15. I didn't take things into consideration about distance and how far things would be getting in the way of me taking my shot. So... I shot at this person, I missed this person, and the person entered the building. Me thinking that Frank is going into the building, and I have my mother's gun. So now she can't protect herself, and now I've, I've basically signed her death sentence. So as I was getting up, I suppose somebody must have seen me shoot and called the police, saying there's a sniper or whatever they're saying. So as I got up, I realized that I looked down the street, and I realized the traffic had stopped. And I look down the street, and I see that there's a police car blocking the street. So I kind of walk like nothing was happening, kind of turn around, and, oh, let me go this way. And I went this way, the other way, and I saw another police car coming down the street. So as I turned around, I saw a police officer that I knew, and they all came, and one of them pulled out a firearm and pointed it at me and told me to put my hands up, and I did. And a detective named Terry McSwiggin, who knew my mom and who knew me, uh, walked up to me. And he asked me, he said, do you have a gun? And I said, yes. I said, but you need to get upstairs because Frank's killing Rita right now. So, so they arrested me. And because I had fired the gun, it had powder on it. it GSR, I think they call it. Right. Gunshot residue. So, so the detective took the gun. I, as I was cuffed in the, in the police car, I was just me and the detective in the unmarked car. And he said, what, what, what did you do? I said, tell him, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I have to protect my mother. I don't have a father. If he's gone, I have nobody. So he took the gun. He wiped it. He took the bullet. And he looked at me and he said, you never fired this. And I said, okay, I never fired it. So what happened there is he left my sentence for me. 
so that I wouldn't go for attempted murder, and then I just had a possession of a firearm, as opposed to a loaded one and or attempted murder or whatever. A different sentence would be for that action that I took. When I was arrested, I was brought in, I was fingerprinted and put in a cell and strip searched at 15. And as I was in jail, <laughs> I heard that Frank Sturgis was arrested. And so Frank did come after I came, because I knew he was coming about 11. I was waiting. He came, and he was arrested by Jim Rothstein and some other detectives, and he was carrying firearms, yada, yada, and he was there to kill my mother. So uh, my actions prevented him from doing that. We were both arrested on that day. I'm sure he didn't plan on a 15-year-old girl stopping an assassin, but I did. And that stopped his actions. I was arrested. He was arrested. He was released later on for however he got released. But he was arrested for coercion, and I was released in my mother's. I was released and had to go for parole. So I, I didn't have to spend any time in, in juvenile home or anything. <sighs> but there's more. <laughs> there's more. There's always more. Oh, I don't think we've told our listeners yet. Uh... Yes. Who's your father? My father is uh, my mother's second assignment, who was the president of Venezuela. And at the time, he was, you know, no longer the president, so they referred to him as the general. So he was General Marcos Perez Jimenez of Venezuela from 1952 to 58. Actually, one of the world's youngest presidents. So my father was known as a dictator, but i got to say, at this point, the corruption level of my father might have been light compared to some of the things I'm even seeing nowadays. So my father was known for infrastructure of Venezuela. He's, he's the roads, the buildings, the, all the main structures were done by my father. So be it that he was expelled due to corruption, he still is known in Venezuela by most as, as the president that did the best or the most for the infrastructure of Venezuela. It was the, Prime time of Venezuela when Venezuela was oil rich and, and more. We had the Miss Venezuela contest. So Venezuela was prime. It was a very high end. Now it's, it's so sad because I do live in Los Angeles is that Venezuelans are walking all over, just come over the border. And it's so sad to see what's happened to the Venezuelan people, to the government there. But that's who my father was. And then when he was extradited when I was a baby, I was never given a penny of his $600 million. Nobody would recognize me until I did DNA, but by that time my father passed. So I, I am a true dichotomy. I, I am now by blood a president's daughter, but I've never seen a dime or an ounce or a, any part of being a president's daughter. None of a president's daughter's benefits. Though. Not, That's not sure, nothing. Yeah. I've lived a very, I've worked my entire life since I was a little girl. I've supported myself for a very long time. I was a world-class bodybuilder and fitness model. And I competed in Arnold Schwarzenegger's first Miss Fitness World as an actress and a stunt woman. So I've done things like this. And I, I guess that that both of my, my grandmother was was a beautiful woman and my mom was known for her for, for being an enticing woman. So Marita and I, as much as I love my mother, you know, she did have a lot of emotional issues after after everything happened in Dallas, we both did. It was a very, very tumultuous time for both of us. And, you know, we had to get through that time. Should we move to the Dallas connection here? You've mentioned that a couple of times also. Sure. A trip to Dallas and uh, involved on the periphery or otherwise with the Kennedy assassination. Right. So Marita's involvement after my father's extradition, she felt in fear for her life. So she went back to her people, which was Frank Sturgis and the group that she worked with, the same group that trained her as an assassin for Fidel Castro. They go, well, we need you for one more mission. We need you for optics for this mission. She goes back to Dallas a few days before. She leaves not knowing why she really was there, but she was sick of being there. Plus, they didn't want her there anymore. So then they sent her back. She went to Miami to get me when she was on the plane from Miami to go back to New York to my grandmother, that's when she heard that Kennedy was assassinated. So that's the timeline on all of that. Was she a part of, in any way, the alleged plot to kill Kennedy in Miami on November 18, four days before? He no, no, she, no, she was not in any way, shape or form. We, it's funny, we just had 
just listening outside again. Marita did, had no idea why she was in Dallas. She had, she didn't know what they were there. She knew it was some sort of mission, but she, like she said, that this mission was different because they brought guns. Usually they're taking guns. They're picking up guns. So, so the logistical circumstances are she's in Miami and she's recruited, if you will. Correct. To be transported over here to Dallas. Right. And so to her, for her to drive with them to Dallas, which right. they did so from she Miami. she in a car. For two days. Miami. Two days. Two cars, two days. And she's in Dallas, has no idea why. No. No, it's just for some something that, you know, and she'd been on a lot of these missions, so she didn't, the difference in this mission was they weren't allowed to speak Spanish, they weren't allowed to wear anything military looking, everything was civilian looking and no Spanish was allowed. And and so they kept everything very, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't go to rest, they kept it so it was very contained. And that, her being there for a few days, plus Marita, you know, physically was going through, was menstruating, and she couldn't get what she needed for that as a woman. So now as a woman, she's like, yo, man, I need these things. And they're like, well, get out of here. You know, take your, take your, your period self and go back, you know, cause we don't want to deal with your woman issue. So Marita became a problem there. And then apparently Jack Ruby came to the door, saw her there and, and. You know where Jack Ruby. Came it's someplace here in Dallas in some hotel. Out not sure where. Not, not, sure not where. his club. No, 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 no. Some, so some hotel in Dallas. Okay. A rough time stamp of this again. I, this is a few days before the assassination. A few days before John Kennedy's assassination, Correct. And, on November twenty second. Yeah, and before that, Marita was here, and then she was here for like two days, and then she left because she was sent back. So they sent her back, and then, like I said, on the airplane, she she heard that the president was assassinated. I usually don't like to speculate that like this, but I'm going to ask you to. Do you suspect she was possibly here? To be charged with the with the murder of President Kennedy? I do not. Okay. I do not think. I think that Frank thought that for optics purposes, if a woman is in a, with a bunch of guys, it looks it doesn't look as as threatening. So just you know, at this point, they were so you know over Marita because she did she failed the Fidel thing. So. No, I don't think they would have trusted her to do anything like that, but. She was used. So if she was used, who else was used? Who else was used in this plot to take away our American president? Yeah. Who? And so now the, the question to me, and what I now want to know is, besides my mother, my gra I lost my grandmother, my dear grandmother, who was poisoned because of this. My grandmother was poisoned because years later, Frank Sturgis was implicated. He's a Watergate burglar. He is, yeah, a.k.a. Frank Fiorini, Fiorini. right? Mm -hmm. So he was implicated. So then he started to open his mouth on public, in the public arena, and, and he implicated himself. He also implicated my mother. So then my mother was called to testify for the House Assassination Committee. Once that happened, Frank wanted her to change her testimony. And he knew this was coming down the pike. So what did he do is, because my grandmother knew everything that my mom knew, to, knew and then some, including Alex Rourke, my grandmother was given an injection, and the injection was was of an unknown paralysis because she died of an unknown paralysis. And so, unfortunately, I watched this process with her body, and it was heartbreaking to watch her get trapped in her own body and not be able to speak, not be able to, to move to the point where she died in front of me from, and she shut down. But while she was dying, before she still, but while she still had voice, she would say, it's the shot. The shot did this to me. The shot, you know, and she knew it. And she knew it. And I knew it, but I don't think my mom wanted to know it. And I think when, it was too painful for my mother. When did your grandmother die? She died November 7th, 1977, a few days after I was arrested on October 31st, 1977. Okay. Now, you've mentioned Alex Rourke. Um, I can later on explain to people who that guy yeah, is, and or you can... I can't actually, because I don't know as much about him as people think I do. I only know that his name always appeared in my world. And he was a friend of my, my grandmother's. My grandmother knew him and my grandmother wrote this article that uh, Castro raped my daughter. There was an article that was, was done because they wanted to turn people against Castro. So my grandmother and Alex Rourke wrote, wrote this controversial piece that's out, old piece from some magazine. Why that happened, I don't know, but but 
they, Alex's work was, was special to my grandmother for some reason and my mom. So when he disappeared, it was a problem. And I know they tried to look for him, but I don't know as much about him other than I was sent to this school because they wanted me to, because Alex went there and he was such an amazing man. So I can't really tell you too much about Alex work. Holy shit. Okay. So let's come back to us for a second. So she, all right. So you go to Dallas. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm in Dallas. You're in Dallas and you sit down and you're talking to this woman and her mother has been tasked by the CIA to kill Fidel Castro because she is his lover. And she goes into the room and pulls a gun out. And he says, go ahead and do it. You can't do it. No one, you can't shoot me. No one can shoot me. And she doesn't. And they make love and she leaves. <laughs> she leaves crying. And her handlers are feeling congratulatory because they feel that she's crying because she just killed the dictator of Cuba. Her lover, so she, uh, she would have um, ambivalent feelings. They're, they're assuming she just feels bad. I, I can't even contemplate what feeling she, feeling she might have had if she had gone through with it, or even having not gone through with it. What a bizarre sequence of events. Listening to Beyond the Classroom. We'll see you next time.